Will AI tools like ChatGPT change how we teach and how we assess our learners? A lot of educators think it will. We'll focus on answering that question in today's episode. Welcome to episode 16 of the EdTech News Brief. I'm your host, Jake Miller. This is the show where, as the title says, I tell you about the EdTech news and I keep it brief. And by brief, I mean clear, concise, and just what you need to know. Nothing more, nothing less. This is episode 16 of the show. It's January 3rd, 2023, and I have got some EdTech news to share with you today. Happy New Year! Hello, news briefers. For those of you who are just coming out of or about to come out of your winter breaks, I hope they were great and super restful. I know you deserved it. And if you were celebrating any holidays, whether it's Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, or something else, I hope they were very merry. Loyal listeners know that I promised an episode right before Christmas, and as you could tell, I was unable to make that happen. Sorry about that. I probably could have had an AI tool just plan, record, and edit the episode for me. And that's what you're going to hear about today, AI. Typically, I devote each episode to at least three different EdTech updates, typically more. But today, we're just going to focus on ChatGPT. Don't worry, this is not an AI version of Jake. I didn't have AI plan, record, and edit this video. I did it myself. This is real Jake. But I've got one big piece of EdTech news to share with you. Here we go. Well, it's now 2023, and we should probably start the year off with the biggest news in ed tech and technology in general, and a topic that we'll probably be discussing the most this year, AI. And the first really big AI or artificial intelligence tool that we need to address is ChatGPT. ChatGPT got many in the educational community all stirred up when it came out at the end of November. What you think of ChatGPT will depend on your perspective. For most educators, it's scary because it'll mean we probably have to change the way we assess student learning and other things too. For others, it's exciting because it will increase what all humans are capable of, truthfully, right? But let's focus on that first group. If you're nervous about ChatGPT, I do have some good news. First, you have to create an account to use it. Second, you're supposed to be at least 18 years old to use it. Third, it's certainly possible to block it on your school network. Those three things mean that the number of students using it will be limited. And fourth, it's free for now, but it probably won't be free for long. So based on those four things, it's probably not going to upset the apple cart right now. However, I am certain that it is a sign that things will be and are changing. And the time to start thinking about this is now. First, we have to understand what it is, so let's dive into that. ChatGPT is an artificial intelligence chatbot that uses a conversational style. So some basic definitions before we dig into ChatGPT itself. It's a piece of artificial intelligence, which as ChatGPT told me, refers to the ability of a computer or machine to perform tasks that would normally require human intelligence. There are varying platforms that utilize artificial intelligence, one of which is a chatbot. A chatbot, again, as ChatGPT told me, simulates conversation with human users. You have probably interacted with artificial intelligence chatbots before, often customer service chatbots on many websites. ChatGPT is like that, but better. The chatbot on your shopping app or your bank's app typically identifies words in your request, searches its own database of support articles, and recommends the article that most closely matches your query. And unlike Google that just shows it as a list of results, it acts like it's talking to you as it recommends these things to you. Those chatbots are essentially search tools with some conversational ability. They're limited to the information that's been loaded into their database, and in those cases, it's typically just that company's support articles, which is pretty limiting. They all use what's called natural language processing to understand and respond to humans. I find that many of those support chatbots struggle with this, possibly because of the limitations of their database of information that they can provide. Next, let's talk about how ChatGPT compares to those chatbots that we've all interacted with. But first, here's a word from today's sponsor. It's a challenge to keep families informed. There's a lot going on. Everyone is busy. 
and no one has time to read. That's where today's sponsor comes in. S'more offers a one-stop shop for school communications. I wish they offered a one-stop shop for marshmallows, chocolate, and graham crackers. But that's a different kind of s'more. This kind of s'more is an easy-to-use online newsletter tool that lets educators create beautiful, interactive updates that parents actually read. Get started with their pre-made templates, easily drag and drop photos and files into them, and you could even reach all families by leveraging their automatic translation feature. Want to add a video introduction to your newsletter? You could do that too. S'more is trusted by more than 1 million educators across almost every school district in the U.S. Visit s'more.com slash podcast for a special discount and to learn more. Compared to those chatbots on other websites, ChatGPT searches a more extensive database of information that was loaded into it. Its AI trainers, those are actual humans, will then look at its interactions with its users and add to that database accordingly. It's likely that in the future, this will happen automatically too. When you talk to it, it's not just searching a tiny amount of preset content like a customer support chatbot is, but it is not searching all of the information on Google either. It's searching data and information that was loaded into it. It's limited database, by the way, means that it's not guaranteed to be 100% accurate. For example, when I first asked it about educational duct tape, it was unfamiliar with my book. It did, however, try to guess what the term educational duct tape might mean, gave a pretty good response. But when I then told it it was a book, it apologized for being wrong and then told me it was a book and incorrectly listed the names of two authors, neither of which were me. So yeah, not 100% accurate. Coincidentally, when I next asked it about educational duct tape, it admitted that it did not know and it did not even attempt to guess the author's name. The way ChatGPT works also means that there could be bias in its responses. Pick a controversial topic, for example, to ask it about, and you may find that its response leans one way or another because of the information that was loaded into it. Both of these issues are part of why we currently have access to this tool. ChatGPT is in a research preview or public beta right now, so it's not a polished, completed project yet. Instead, it's out there for us to mess around with. And that's not necessarily because the creators are generous. It's because they want to learn from its interactions with us. You can give the thumbs up or thumbs down options to rate its responses. You can also elaborate on that feedback as well. I have noticed that it's improved since I first interacted with it. So there may be some tweaking happening as time passes as well. For example, I once asked it who Jake Miller was and it told me about the singer. The next time, it explained that there are several Jake Millers, but the two famous ones were the singer and an NFL player. That was news to me. I've never heard of an NFL player named Jake Miller. Anyhow, it got better and it changed, right? The blog post that announced the availability of this beta states, we've trained a model called ChatGPT, which interacts in a conversational way. The dialogue format makes it possible for ChatGPT to answer follow-up questions, admit its mistakes, challenge incorrect premises, and reject inappropriate requests. They do concede that a limitation of ChatGPT is that it sometimes writes plausible sounding but incorrect or nonsensical answers, and that if the user's request is ambiguous or unclear, the current models usually guess what the user intended rather than asking clarifying questions. And in my testing, I saw it do both of those things. As for the inappropriate requests, they're working to have it deny them using a tool called Moderation API to warn or block certain types of unsafe content. As with all other elements of this tool, though, this is something they're probably still working on through this beta. When you start using ChatGPT, it tells you right away that it's a free research preview and that it may occasionally generate incorrect or misleading information and produce offensive or biased content. It also reminds us that it is not intended to give advice. It also informs you that your conversations may be reviewed by their AI trainers to improve their systems. I mean, that's the purpose of this. So we see three flaws right there that they are working on during this beta. It's not 100% accurate. It doesn't always understand our questions or seek to clarify them. And it may respond to inappropriate requests or it may identify appropriate requests as inappropriate. Before we get into classroom implications, I want to point out a few things. It's free to use, but it's likely that after they've used this beta testing experience to get it working really well, it won't be free anymore. 
In fact, the FAQ on their site actually says, during the initial research preview, ChatGPT is free to use. That implies to me that it won't be free after this initial research preview. Next, you have to create an account to use it. It's free to do so, but it's a hurdle that may keep some students from using it. And finally, you have to be 18 years old or older to use it. We all know that some learners use tools that they're not technically old enough to use, but again, another hurdle. Before jumping into classroom implications, a few reminders. If you're watching in YouTube, click the thumbs up to tell me thanks, click subscribe, and ring that notifications bell. If you're listening to the podcast, don't forget to follow the show or subscribe if that's what your app says. And if you have a moment, submit a review. If this is your first time listening to or watching the show, today was formatted a little differently than typical episodes. Typically, we discuss at least three and often more like five or six different ed tech tool updates. So you may want to subscribe so that you can be with me next week when we discuss a new Google Slides feature, tons of updates to Flip, a new Wii video editor, and an update to quizzes, and probably a new AI tool because I think we probably better keep up with AI during this year. Okay, so let's talk implications. Before we get into the bad parts, which is where many of your minds probably went, let's talk about benefits. There are a lot, probably more than we could even imagine. AI can help us create learning experiences that are personalized to our students' interests and needs. It can provide assistance and accessibility. You can even ask it to define things for a five-year-old or a 14-year-old or things like that. It told me that it can speak and understand and write in many languages, including but not limited to English, Spanish, French, German, Chinese, Japanese, and Russian, and there are more. It can edit our students' writing, act as a debate opponent or a discussion partner, and give them feedback on their work. For you, the educator, it could take things off of your plate, which, hey, we've always wanted something that takes things off of our plate. It could generate writing prompts. It could generate questions about specific topics. It can even give you the answer key for those questions. And get this, it can write a pretty great lesson plan. And if a negative is its ability to write essays, stories, poems, and other text creations for our students, well, then we could use those creations in our classes as things to evaluate, analyze, or build off of. That obviously leads us directly into the negatives. Yes, of course, it can be used for plagiarism. And while there are a number of tools out there attempting to help you identify AI-generated text content, I have not seen proof yet that any of them are 100% effective, or yet close to 100%. And since it can write at a variety of complexities, it's not as obvious as when your student grabs text from Wikipedia. I mean, when you see that copied and pasted stuff from Wikipedia, you know hmm, something's wrong here. But with this tool, it could, it could do things in a variety of ways that might not be as easy to notice. And it never replies the same way twice. Seriously, you can even click regenerate response and you'll get a new version of it. So if two of your students use it to generate answers, they won't turn in identical responses. By the way, an article from Forbes pointed out that a great way to avoid these issues, put your prompt into chat GPT and see if it gives a good response. If it does, you may need a new prompt. For example, I tried out one of the classic science prompts explain the parts of a cell using the metaphor of a city, and ChatGPT nailed it. So you may choose to not use that one anymore. But writing tasks isn't its only feature. It can even solve math problems and show you the steps as it goes. A few fun applications of this tool, by the way. My son and I had a blast having it generate stories and then turn them into sea shanties, poems, songs, rap battles, and show scripts. I also love that it can also suggest illustrations for the pages of a story that it generates. My friend Tony Vincent shared an example of asking it to generate some HTML code for him, and it was accurate code that he was able to copy and use on his site. Next up, let's talk about some of the impacts and decisions that we have to make for our classrooms and schools. But first, I'd like to tell you about my book, Educational Duct Tape and EdTech Integration Mindset in which I seek to equip you to overcome the paradox of choice and select the right ed tech tools for your classroom so that you could start using those tools tomorrow. You know, even though ChatGPT does know a thing or two about some ed tech tools, it cannot help you choose the best tool for your classroom or your content or your style. But the educational duct tape mindset, it can. Check it out on Amazon. So back to ChatGPT. This is just the beginning. 
tech will never look the same again. Many folks have pointed out that this is the MySpace or Atari or Commodore 64 of AI. And they're right. Our students will look back at this someday and laugh. Well, maybe that's not quite right because there's AI that came before this stuff. But seriously, someday AI is going to be so much more impressive than this. So the question that most educators in schools are asking or have already asked and maybe have already answered is, should we block it? Well, there are pros and cons. A few questions before you decide, though. Did you permit or deny cell phone use? How did that go? D. Lanier pointed out in a Ditch Summit video, did you block or allow Wikipedia? How did that go? For either situation, did you teach your students how to utilize it effectively? Would you change the way you approached it now? Notice and consider those parallels. If you block it, what about when the next one comes out and the next one and the next does it? There will be other AI chatbots and tools. This is just the first high powered one. And even if you do block it, you still might use it at home. If AI is part of our learners' futures, which it almost certainly is, does it make sense to keep it out of our classrooms? It might, but it might not. Or does it make sense to bring it in and help our students learn to use it effectively? It might, maybe it's not time yet. Regardless of whether you believe it should be blocked or permitted, I think it makes sense for all of us to block it at least until you have put in the work necessary to plan how we make it a beneficial and effectively used element of our students' learning experiences, not a tool to avoid. This will probably involve some discussions with your colleagues and more importantly, your learners. By the way, imagine if more schools had done this effectively with cell phones and Wikipedia before they were in the hands of all learners and before the pandemic made them a part of our young people's everyday lives. Imagine if we had talked to them about how cell phones and Wikipedia could help and how they could be a problem. Would things be different? Could we do that here with AI tools? For now, not all of our students have access to AI, but someday they will. How can we get them ready? How can we scaffold it into their learning environment so that they're ready when it's part of their futures outside of the classroom? I don't know the answers, but I know that it's time to start asking those questions and discussing it. I did a lot of reading and video watching about AI and chat GPT to prepare for covering this topic. So if you want to go further, check out some of the links in the show notes or video descriptions. Those are the ones that I cited somewhere here in this episode. But if you reach out to me, I could provide additional resources that I also learned from. I will say my favorite of all of them is the blog post on the Ditch That Textbook site. It is by far the most extensive. And as Matt Miller always does, he writes it with an educator's keen eye. And finally, the way I cop off every episode is with a dad joke straight from the world's greatest dad jokes, the complete collection, over 500 cringeworthy puns and one-liners book. Let's see what I get here. Flip it to a random page. Why did the banana leave the party early? He had the split. <laughs> well, I do have to split now, but I really appreciate you tuning in. I hope to be back again next week, and I really hope that you will be back too. I'd really appreciate it if you do some of those awesome things like rating or reviewing the show on Apple Podcasts, liking or subscribing to the show on YouTube, following the po podcast in your favorite app, and of course, sharing this episode. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.